It's December 29th, 2020. We're past Christmas, but it's not quite the, the uh, new year. We only have a few days left, Greg, to make it through this hellscape that has been 2020. But not a hellscape is the knee jerk Detroit sports talk of Eno and Big Al. I'm Big Al of the Equation, longtime Detroit Pace blogger and podcaster Al Beaton. Joining me as always is the man who knows a lot of things about a lot of things. He has the cutest dog in the Mississippi. And, uh,. No, oh, he'll tell you about what else is going on in his life, and that would be Greg Eno of uh, the Out of Bounds blog and numerous other places on the web. Greg, what's up? Hey, Al Beaton. Yes, uh, Happy New Year. I uh, hope you had a good uh, Christmas, you and everybody else out there. Um, we are nearing, indeed, the end of 2020. Um, I, I would caution anybody to think that the ma- flipping of the calendar will yeah. magically make everything go away, but... Uh, you can at least say it's a new year in a few days, so that that's a good thing. You can read me as Al indicated uh, on my WordPress blog, uh, Out of Bounds blog, and uh, check that out. Pretty much every Monday-ish, I have a new piece. Up. My most recent one was about uh, the late Phil Necro, who passed away over the holiday, or not, uh, not well, all, all the weekend, I should say. Phil, Phil was 81. I did a piece on Phil. Uh, check me out there. Follow me on Twitter, at Greg Emo. Follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter, at the knee jerks. Uh, lots to do, even though it's kind of a quiet time in sports. There's still something to talk about. We've got some Tiger stuff. They made a move. We've got, uh, of course, the Lions uh, doing their Lions thing. Uh, Pistons um, <laughs> the Lions thing. started their season. Revin's getting ready to do the same. Uh, but before we do any of that, we're going to play a game that we like to call Whose Birthday Is It? Maestro. Basically, everybody knows how to play this game by now. You could add a clue or two or three. Of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports, and if Al can quickly guess that person within the first two clues, he will receive a nice coffee table book, The History of the World Series of Poker. So, <laughs> oh, I'm sure it'd be featuring people like Phil Hellmuth, and I can't think of any other poker players. <laughs> uh, Gabe Kaplan. Oh, yeah, that's right. He did make a name for himself as a <laughs> uh, post acting and comedy as a poker player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I forgot it. Yeah. Okay, that's two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's the the personnel. This person made his name in the world of football. I will tell you that he was born on this date in 1936. Sadly, passed away kind of young uh, in 1998 at the age of 61. Uh, but a big time uh, uh, pro football player, Hall of Famer uh, for a legendary franchise of the of the 60s, uh, and he was, um, uh, of course, a multi champion of the NFL um, and considered one of the best at his position ever and um, I'll, 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 stop I'll stop there all right what what they, uh, year did you say he passed away he passed away in 98 he was born in 36 born in 36 passed away in 98 um, and he said he played in the that would mean he would have played in the 50s and 60s give or take and that's but that was it huh that's all you're giving me I said he was a Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer. And that he played for one of the legendary franchises of the decade. All right. Uh, and one of the very best at his position. Hmm. I'm just going to throw it out there and say, uh, of that of the decade, I'll try Art Donovan. No, 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 no. Ah. Nope, 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 nope. Oh, we're getting nope. a lot of nope, 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 nope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the reason he came to mind because uh, cause I remember him being on Letterman all the time. So kind of in that kind of, kind of, in that era, yeah, kind of, kind of, sort of. No, all right, no, he might have been a little early for that. What's that? He might have been a little earlier. Art yeah, Donovan. Well, yeah, their careers did overlap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and for all the uh, the younger kids who might be listening to this, Art Donovan probably became more famous for doing beer commercials and appearing on David Letterman than for his football career, which he was uh, yeah. what a Colts defensive lineman, if I remember right. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did, I think, wasn't his, I might be wrong, but wasn't his uh, autobiography called They Call Me Fatso or... Something Fatso like that, or, yeah. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a damn funny guy, it turned out. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, but uh, I guess I'm just going to have to, I can't make room on my coffee table just yet, so... Not yet, not yet. <laughs> All right, with that, let's get the uh, show on the road, because we got... Uh, well, actually, I got places to go, but not for a couple of days yet. But regardless of that, we want to get this uh, going here. We got a lot to talk about. 
Uh, let's start, of course, as we have been, I think, for the last six months, Greg, and that would be the Detroit Lions. Uh, one, there, there was a god-awful game this past Saturday, you know. Uh, Lions were absolutely destroyed by Tom Brady and the Bucks. But before we get to that, they made news earlier in the week, I would say Monday, the day after they lost to the Titans 46-25, when there was a shocking breaking news and that interim head coach Daryl Bevel had fired special teams coordinator Braden Coombs for essentially insubordination. Uh, he had been let go for ignoring Bevel's instructions, and he called a fake punt. This happened, what, probably about midway later into the fourth quarter of the game. They were down two or three scores at that point as it was. And... Uh, Matt Stafford had just been hit hard twice, and at that, it's at, Stafford was battling his uh, the torn cartilage in his ribs. He was showing a lot of pain, and Bevel decided he just wanted to get off the get his quarterback off the field. Why he couldn't have brought in his backup, I don't know. But regardless of that, he want he just wanted to punt the ball. Coombs didn't like that call, and apparently he said, "We're going to run a fake punt." And he only told the few people involved in the play. He didn't tell the entire special teams unit. So only a handful of players even knew there was a fake punt. The punt, the fake punt failed, actually. And surprisingly, it looked like if they had actually asked for a replay review, it might have they might have gotten the call. But for whatever reason, Spevel didn't. Lions end up losing. They were going to lose the game anyway. But the next day, the next morning, actually, all this came out. And as an interim head coach, Bevel went to team president Rod Wood for permission to fire Coombs, and that wish that permission was granted. Uh, and it kind of shocked the fan base and some, some in the media because uh, Coombs was, and probably still is, considered a rising star in the coaching ranks. He's only in his early 30s. And the Lions special teams were really the only consistent bright spot in what's been a horrific Lions season. They've, uh, they have a Pro Bowl punter, uh, the, their uh, return games have been on point as uh, Jamal Agnew has, uh, has two return touchdowns. And the uh, coverage teams have been pretty darn good. So that, that's that been one of the bright spots of this team. And there was a lot of talk that at the time, maybe Coombs should have become the interim head coach rather than Bevel or um, Corey uh, Udlin, the uh, defensive coordinator. But regardless of all that, that all went out the window when Coombs was fired for essentially insubordination, disobeying orders. And uh, obviously, the fan base has become split, Greg, because some think Bevel was, uh, considering he's an interim coach, he was taking too much authority. He did, he really shouldn't have been making the type of move that could, well, you could say it a franchise-altering move, considering Coombs was, a lot of talk, Coombs would be the one coach who would survive the Patricia regime, and the next coaching staff would probably keep him. That went all out the window with this controversy. And there's a lot of fans that think Bevel shouldn't have done this. Obviously, there's people that think that maybe the Lions shouldn't have done this so late in the season because there's only two weeks left in the year anyway. But there's there was also reports there might have been more into this as some in the media were uh, intimating that there was likely more to the story here and this was actually the final straw, the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think there's a lot more to it than we'll yeah. ever find out, Greg. I tend to fall into that. I, well, I'm, 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 I have a couple opinions on that. Basically, yes, the head coach had every right to fire him. And two, this probably was the final straw. Something else was going on behind the scenes. So where, where, where do you fall on this? What's your take on all this? Well, it's funny because you know, I was, as you're talking about this, and, 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 and I didn't really – think of this when, it, when I first read about it, but then as I was reflecting on it again when you were um, introducing this topic, I was, mm -hmm. it dawned on me, I don't recall very many instances, if any, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm, but I'm sure this is not unprecedented, where uh, an, an interim coach has fired an assistant coach. Right. It's very unusual, uh, unless the interim takes you know, over maybe earlier in the year, but yeah. with this few games left, it, it was really... Kind of an odd scenario. You don't see that very often, and, and I don't know if there's really much to read into that or not, mm -hmm. because it was the, the lines, as you said, uh, purported it to be a a culture thing that had been in the works for a while, yes. and that 
some folks thought that um, Coombs might have been a little bit too self-serving and what have you. Certainly calling a fake punt without the head coach's you know, knowledge or approval is not a good thing. I don't care who the head coach is, whether it's right. a, a, an interim or not. But, um, you know, I... I you know it's just it's just weird. I mean, I, I if if something was brewing with this guy Combs, he was only 34, I think. Mm-hmm. And and uh, then yeah, I can see I can see we're doing something like that. With you know you still got to you know can I work with this guy for three more games? You know what what does this say about me? And frankly, Bevel, you know, and we talk a lot about players playing for next year. Players yeah. playing. You mentioned it last time, you know, these guys are, are trying to get on film and, and maybe get jobs elsewhere in the league if it doesn't work out here, Detroit. And Bevel's in the same boat. I mean, you know, he, mm-hmm. if he's going to apply for a head coaching job somewhere else, because I don't think he'll get this job here, but if he applies for a head coaching job somewhere else, you know, he's he's got a little bit of a resume he, and, a, and a portfolio he wants to protect as well. Mm-hmm. And if we're, you know, and you know, Al, these, these people in the league talk to each other, and if, if word gets around – that this Combs guy was out of control and, and Bevel didn't, you know, whether he was the interim guy or not, Bevel didn't really do anything about it. Well, then that's that's going to come back and maybe look make Bevel not look so good in terms of, you know, if if he's going to go in for an interview, it, he, he can say, look, we had this situation in Detroit. We had a um, insubordination with an assistant, and I, you know, I I I, fun- I was functioning as the head coach. And I, I did head, head coaching type things made a head coaching type decision and you know so that would make him look good in the eyes of people who are interviewing him in terms of making those kinds of decisions uh obviously the one who comes out the, looking the worst in all this is Coombs himself I mean, right. you know, he, he's he you know i don't know if he's torpedoed his career necessarily by doing something like this but you know if, if he indeed did this the way this was uh, laid out and, and he's been having some difficulty then he's not gonna you know, he's going to have some difficulty finding a yeah. job in, in the NFL. I mean, you know, these these jobs are few and far between. They're, you know, people, it's an old boys network, as you know. You, once you get in that fraternity, you know, you can start moving around. You, you'll move around a lot. It's like being a, it's like being a, an Army brat times 10. You're moving mm-hmm. around. Look at the resumes on these assistant coaches. Right. I mean, they're just, they're, 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 no, they're never in more than, they're never in the same place more than two years, it seems like. So you're going to move around, but these guys move around. They, once they get into that, they get in the league. It's it, everybody moves around. It, yeah, it's not a lot of new blood that comes in, except with a very low level right. of assistance. So uh, if you know, Combs, he was a special teams coordinator. I mean, yeah. that, that's pretty good for an, in the NFL. There's only 32 jobs like that in the world. Mm-hmm. He had one of them, and he was young, and he was looked at as maybe an up and coming guy. And yes, he know, was. He had coaching material, but maybe something promotions were in his future but now you know um it's it's questionable so it, you know he definitely comes out looking the worst bevel probably comes out looking pretty good because he, he made a, a decision that was uh you know that, that normally a guy in his position would make and so um the lines back backed it but i don't think it has any bearing on whether or not he becomes gets the full-time job at the end of the year yeah yeah, there's a, a few things uh, that come to mind with this. Is uh, yeah, one, uh, you're right about Bevel. You know, he's thinking about his future, and if someone, you know, when his because ne- obviously he's not going to get the head coaching job, but when he goes for his next interview for coordinator, or head coach, whatever, for, at whatever level, they're going to be they're going to ask him if he didn't if he hadn't fired Coombs or he had just right. decided to let it ride. He goes, well, why didn't you get get rid of a guy who undercut your authority? You know, he <laughs> said you let him walk all over you. You know, so Bevel had no choice in the matter, and he was smart in that he actually, you know, he went to a, reportedly Rod Wood, who's in, and he had the Lions uh, organizational blessing. Uh, but uh, he is in every, he had every right to do so because interim or not, he's the head coach, and that comes with all responsibilities with that and that includes you know if you feel a head coach is undermining your authority you have every right to get rid of the guy especially on a team that's likely going to blow everything up anyway and there was no guarantee Coombs was going to come back there was a lot of talk that he could but with the uh, you know this fan base sometimes Greg it just drives me bad because there are a lot of fans who said oh he shouldn't have done that he should have just talked it out he should have just Maybe suspended him for a game, or he should have just dealt with it and kept it internal. And 
and just moved on with his life, blah, blah, blah. And anybody who says that, Greg, has never held a position of authority in his life. He's never had to be a boss. He's never had to own or run a business. He's never been in a position of authority where there is a hierarchy and uh, it ultimately the buck stops with one person, and in this case, it's Daryl Bevel. And if Bevel had just let it slide or had just decided to ignore it or handle it in any other kind of a way, that would have looked awful in, one, the locker room, because you know the, the guys in the locker the players knew what had happened after the game anyway. So, one, that completely makes him look weak in the eyes of the locker room, makes him look weak in front of the other coaches. Uh, you just, there is a, a line you don't cross. And disobeying orders, or disobeying, I, and I hate using the term orders, we're talking about football, we're not talking about the military, but essentially disobeying and ignoring the chain of command. Uh, you, it's, you can't do that in a business situation, and this is essentially a business situation. And obviously, Coombs thought it's better to ask forgiveness than ask permission. And obviously, he thought wrong because, one, it didn't work, and two, he ended up getting fired over it. But that's what gets me is that, you know, I've been a boss. I've had to hire and fire people. I've run businesses. I've had to... Oh, Alexa, stop timer. Stop alarm. <laughs> Com computer, stop alarm. All right. And you, sometimes, you know, you, you, you're, I've had to people, I had to fire people I liked, but I had to fire them because they didn't do what they were told or they, for, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they either tried to undercut authority or they tried, they had to just work doing their job the, the way it should have been or for whatever, or for, for God forbid, they just weren't pulling their own weight. Sometimes people get fired Sometimes it's deserving, sometimes it's not. But for this, in this case, Coombs deserved to be fired. He's going to catch some backlash over this. He probably won't get a coordinator's job again for uh, who knows. Maybe he'll probably end up getting one, but it won't be anytime soon because this is a really bad look. So I'm I'm 100% behind the Lions and Bevel in this case. Coombs screwed up big time and may have shot his career in a foot. And anybody who thinks that it should have been ignored or it should have been handled differently, I'd hate to see them handle, try to uh, handle people because sometimes you have to be the bad guy and you have to fire people. And in this case, there was no choice. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the Lions, um, you know, if one of the things that fan, the fan base has been upset about is is. Lack of accountability. You know, yeah, always talk about bingo. Lack of accountability yeah. And, you know, I know, I know a lot of times that starts foolishly at the top, which is silly because the owners you know, are only accountable to, the, to their fans and, mm -hmm. and, and they can't be fired. We know that. But if, if you truly want to, you know, walk the walk about authority, and I'm, I'm sorry about uh, transparency and about um, 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 accountability, then this is the kind of movie that you should be, you, you should be supporting. Right. But the thing about uh, Al, too, is that uh, I wonder, I, I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, do you think Combs gets fired if that fake punt works and they get the first down? If it's me, yeah. If yeah. I'm running the team, yeah. I don't know how what Bevel would think, but I guess that leads it into there had to be more going on here because if this is the right. first offense, this is probably handled differently. Right. There's got to be, a, you know, as as, it, as you mentioned earlier, that there was talk that Coombs was out for himself, that he was showboating, that he was uh, essentially doing things that he, well, essentially trying to make himself look good at the expense of others. So if this works, it might be handled differently in that, you know, they may be able to sweep it under the rug or just keep it behind closed doors. You know, I would have still fired him because you just can't have that. But obviously, every manager, every coach, every boss is different. But for it to be handled the way it was, for you know, twelve oh, like twelve hours later, he's fired. That means there was probably this was a combination of things, and this was like the paper trail is complete. We can fire him now. Yeah, yeah, right. That's you know, I think that's where we're that's where we are finally at with that. So you know, and I, so I have no problem with this and. 
you know, in the end, it really doesn't make that much difference because the Lions are likely going to lose out, and the whole uh, coaching staff was going to get broomed anyway for the most part. I mean, there's no guarantee any of them was going to come back, any coach on the team. So, I mean, uh, uh, defensive coordinator uh, Corey Udell today said, I expect everybody to get fired. You know, he was he was blunt yeah. about it. I expect everybody to be fired. So I guess which leads us to what happened. Uh, I want to say Sunday. What happened Saturday? Because the uh, there's a whole uh, got a whole lot to discuss about this game. Not so much about the game itself, because it was a blowout from the get go. And Tom Brady looked like uh, the Tom Brady of 10, 15 years ago, the way he was slinging the ball around. You know, he threw for. Uh, 346 yards, four TDs, and a perfect passer rating in the first half and didn't even uh, take a snap in the second half. But I think this is one of the, one of the other things that kind of undercut Bevel is that uh, we don't know all the details yet, but apparently early in the week uh, there, was a, there was a small, either a few people on the team tested positive for COVID-19. The NFL ultimately forced the Lions to play the game without Daryl Bevel, without uh, Corey Undlin, and without the majority of the defensive coaching staff due to COVID-19 contact tracing. And obviously they had had a uh, contact tracing had shown that they had been in, con- you know, in close proximity with people who had tested positive for COVID-19. And I don't think, I don't think it's ever come, it has not yet been absolutely confirmed, but there were beat writers saying there were rumors or talk or hints or sources, however you want to put it, saying that there was a coach who had removed his contact tracing bracelet, was not wearing a mask, and was holding meetings inside closed rooms, all violations of NFL COVID-19 protocols. So if all that is true and the way the, the league tended to handle this, for us, that there, you are not getting the benefit of the doubt, the game is not being moved, you are playing the game, that leads me to believe that, yeah, the Lions probably did violate protocols and the uh, NFL was not going to give them a break on this. So, Because what's funny is the game was flexed to Saturday a few weeks ago because of, you know, they, they were going to have a, a triple header on, on uh, NFL Network and they wanted Tom Brady on TV. So the 1 o'clock game got flexed from Sunday to Saturday. If the game had been played on Sunday, the coaching staff would have been, on, would have been, in, would have been able to participate. But since the game was on Saturday, they couldn't because of the, I think it was like the five days of having to test negative. So that led to uh, essentially video guys and guys who uh, position coaches being uh, – I think what Ron Prince, the wide receivers coach, ended up being the, head, the interim, the interim, interim head coach in this game, and it was a debacle from the get go. They were down thirty-four nothing at the half, and but I have no sympathy at all for the Lions, Greg, if they were breaking protocol, and from all indications they were, uh, and uh, so again that we have coaches going rogue, much like uh, we have Coombs going rogue the week before. Now we have a coach going rogue when it comes to contact tracing at the protocols, and here we are. We have a, another black eye for the Lions organization. Nationally televised game, last uh, three quarters of their coaching staff unable to participate, and they get absolutely smoked by Tampa Bay. Uh, it was actually laughable when you think about it, you know. But here we, you know, I'm not surprised it happened this way because Lions being Lions, but. Oh, my God, what a mess. Well, you know, it's too bad that, um, first of all, I, I'm with you. I agree the, the league did the right thing. I, the, the league doesn't know the Lions anything. Yeah. Now, these, these fans who, on the one hand, will, you know, say it's Detroit versus everybody, and the Lions always get jobs and everything like that. And, you know, hey, you know, be better. Be a better That's a loser team. mentality, if you if ask better me. better football team, if you're a better football team, you're in the you're in the. Yeah. In the playoff hunt consistently. If you are a winning organization, maybe those kinds of things, those kind of calls go uh, go your way. I don't know, but yeah. um, you know the uh, the um, the sad part about it is that the, the timing was such that it was it, it was indeed a nationally televised game. That was that yeah. was the thing that you know if it was a regional broadcast. Yeah, the Detroit and Tampa people would have seen that's one thing, but the whole country had to see this debacle, and uh, you know, and, and 
the coaching situation aside, it, mm-hmm. it wasn't that wasn't the reason why the Lions lost forty seven to seven. Right. And, yeah. And, exactly. And, and I, I mean, it didn't help. It didn't help certainly, and it didn't yeah. help Matthew Stafford. You know, missed almost the entire game, but yeah. they're just a bit, that just that defense is just absolutely god awful. And and uh, I, when I saw that game play out, it reminded me of I don't know if you remember this. This was gosh, this is going back to. I want to say 2004, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, Peyton Manning in Detroit. Oh, uh, the sixth uh, touchdown game, wasn't was, he? threw for six was, touchdowns. Oh, he carved yeah. the lines up like a turkey. And could have thrown ten touchdown passes if he really wanted to. Right. Uh, Brady probably could have had seven or eight touchdown passes. If he had yeah, he could have thrown for 600 yards and who knows how much. Oh, exactly. yeah. It would have been yeah. record-setting maybe across the board. Right. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the defense is just – you know, it's like no contact drills out there. I mean, it's just yeah. absolutely no. You know, they let Derek. And I get it; these guys are good players. I get it that Rodgers is good. Aaron Rodgers is good. I get it that that Brady's good. I get it that you know uh, Derek Henry, that running back from Tennessee. I get right. it; he's great. I understand that. I get it. But uh, th- th- these guys, they're the play, when they play the Lions, it's like the men, men among boys. I mean, they're, yeah. playing, they're playing boys, and um, they can't tackle. They don't have any speed. Um, that the Thai guy, that that uh, Jelani the Thai or Tavai, 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 yeah, was getting roasted on the internet by the on, on Twitter by the Lions fans as being maybe the worst defender in the in the in the league right now. Yeah, certainly worst starting defender in the league. Yep, he was. Um, he's been a a, 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 pilot a bust, who, just a bust, pure and simple. Yeah, and and there's just been so many. You know, look at that roster, Al, and so many. And think about the guys that aren't even on the team. They're Tease Tabor, you know, you see, yep. second round. And for some reason, Bob Quinn had a lot of problems with the second round above both sides of the ball. Yep. But, yeah, the defense just, uh, it was really a, just a, a, a embarrassing. No, And no one looked good. No one. No, a, and, no, no one on the defense looked you know, good. It was about Brady. In, in yeah. fairness, it was, it was about Brady. That's what the fans, if anybody who turned tuned into that game. Yeah. Uh, wanted to see a you know a Tom Brady in a Bucks uniform because not a lot of people have been able to see that. It's not, not like the Bucks have been all over national TV yeah. this season. So this was an opportunity for them to see Brady in a Bucks uniform, an opportunity to see them clinch a playoff spot for the first time in a long time. Yep. And and indeed, um, that's what they saw. Yeah. In, in spades. Yeah. Well, I think one of my favorite lines of the the broadcast uh, was that. Uh, uh, Mark Schlereff was doing the color for NFL Network, and there was they were showing a replay of uh, one of Rob Gronkowski's touchdowns, and there was no one within 10, 15 yards of him, right up, you know, go right, right, right up the middle through a slot, and also, and and when he was asked, well, what could the Lions have done there? And, and Schlereff said, I don't know, maybe someone should have covered him. <laughs> You know, and again, and that is you know, a tight end. That's usually going to be a linebacker, and the Lions have linebackers that could be. Well, I could probably outrun a couple of their linebackers, and I'm 59 years old and they have arthritis. That's how slow their linebackers are. So, uh, yeah, the whole. If there was a game this year that would have opened the eyes to the most blindly loyal Lions supporter, thinking. Oh, and they might be able to turn this 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 around fairly quickly. But you know, that this game against Tampa should have opened right and saying, "This is a multi-year rebuild, specifically on the defense." And there's really not much they can really do about that because when you look at that defense, who do you keep? I mean, there's some guys who you'll have to keep because of contract. Or you could really wipe out that entire starting eleven, and I don't think. The Lions would be that worse off of whoever they could replace them with because they're really a uh, there's there is so little hope in how that defense has been built and how it's played in for the future. And there are some big ass contracts on that defense of guys like Trey Flowers and Justin Coleman. Uh, well, the Jeff Okuda, a few of these guys are making some significant amount of money, and the performance. Oh my God, it's. That that defensive performance that was wor- probably worse than most of the defensive performances we saw in two thousand eight when they lost all sixteen games. That's how bad it was. You know, Al, when you have a yeah, you're, you're right. By the way, I, mm-hmm. I I think I even tweeted that out. I don't remember the old sixteen team having that kind of that kind of 
I mean, Looking that I, uncompetitive yeah. defensively, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And it's just been getting worse, too, by the way. The defense has been getting worse as the yep. season has gone on. I mean, there's no question about it. That was a mail-it-in game, if yep. we ever saw one. Yep, absolutely. Um, but that's, that's why this general manager thing, Al, I think is mm-hmm. almost – Almost more important than the, the coach. I mean, because you need if you if you look at the you look at the, the shape that the Lions were left in, and you know, yeah, we've had so many bad. You and I have seen so many bad um, <laughs> GMs in this town, and, and yes, all the we have. guys and, and but even recently with Stan Van Gundy, you think of the state in which he left the Pistons. Yep, uh, both in terms of salary cap scenarios and, and roster construction and so forth, and and then you look at what Quinn has left his successor yep. um, and um, you, you're absolutely right there really isn't anybody you know if you had if, you, if somebody said look guys we're going to get rid of everybody on this defensive unit and start from scratch you really wouldn't say you really wouldn't put up much of a fight about that I mean there might yep. be a couple of guys you'd say gosh could we maybe keep him or keep him but I remember uh, our old friend Jack McCloskey who, who offered his entire roster mm-hmm. yep. to the Los Angeles Lakers for yeah. yeah, and um, he was serious, and yeah. uh, the the Lakers said oh, we can't do that, and I, I, you know the Lions almost really could just just yeah. look. We're gonna nobody's got a job next year. I mean, you can't do that. I know that because of the contracts. But right. that's why this is so important now because it takes so many. You've got to have a guy that can see not only the talent, but he's got to be able to work the contracts. He's got to be able to to. You know, there's a lot of things in that. In fairness, it's not like the old days when you just, uh, you know, you, you drafted guys and you traded some guys for some draft picks. And with all these salary cap things and all these other, so many things that, that go into constructing. I'm not saying it's easy. Don't get me wrong. This is not. Yeah. A, it's not an easy thing to do. Right. That's why it's it's so. But at the same time, it's so important that you get somebody. Um, Bob Quinn, obviously, you know, you, you just. It's like Troy Weaver moving in here with the Pistons. There's some concern about how much did Troy Weaver really have to do with the success yeah. of the Thunder. And now it's the same thing with Quinn. You know, what? Mm-hmm. how much did he really have to do right. with the success of the Pages? We know he was a scouting guy. We know he, we know he, he um, you know, rose up through the ranks internally with the Patriots, and that's great. But there's that leap, obviously, from being a scouting guy slash personnel guy um, to being that the general manager who now has has to you know negotiate contracts and and play the play uh, play the long game. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's so hard too. You got to play the long game when you're a GM. You got to think about money. You got to think about you got to be thinking two or three moves ahead. It's it's not you know it's not just about what's going on right now. There's there's a lot of you know um, decisions that are made that are really made for down the line and not so much for right now. Right. It's tough to find somebody who has those kinds of qualities who's done it before. So mm-hmm. I'm almost more okay with the first-time head coach if the Lions decide to go that route than I am a first-time GM. A first-time GM scares me a little bit because there's first of all we've seen a lot of a lot of well, it doesn't work a lot of times number one, right. but more importantly, uh, I, I, it's it's just something that I feel like um, if 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 they don't get it right now this time with with, with this new guy, mm-hmm. who knows what, how many more years they'll set the franchise back. Whereas if you do get it right now, yeah. you have a shot at maybe you know in two or three years rising back up and uh, being uh, taken seriously again. So yeah. that's why this hire is so important. I would almost put this hire out. Uh, higher up in the in, the, in 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 terms of importance, as far as getting it right, mm-hmm. than I do the coach. The, co- the coaches are a little bit easier to fire and get rid of and switch off. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not as easy with the GM because he's got a lot of you know irons in the fire when he leaves, and his, his imprint, a GM's imprint, is felt way longer after he leaves than a coach's ever ever is. Yeah, we're so finding out. Coach, we're already seeing that. The rug, as soon as you yeah. get rid of a coach. And a coaching staff, they're gone. Mm-hmm. But when you get rid of a GM and he leaves you with a, a, a bare cupboard like Bob Quinn did, uh, that's tough to overcome. Yeah, and well, as you bring up, you know, this this franchise, I don't think, as far as I can remember, has never had a experienced GM. Everybody they brought in has this has been their first GM job. I mean, Russ Thomas, Chuck Schmidt, 
uh, Matt Millen, Martin Mayhew, Bob Quinn. I think that covers pretty much our lifetime for the most yeah. part. Yeah, and every single one of them was either brought in from the outside from either scouting or coaching or something of that rig or a, or had an in with the Fords, which was essentially which was Schmidt and and uh, Thomas, or you know for whatever this team has. I don't think this team has ever brought in an outside general manager who had the experience. It's always right. been no, first time guys. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of fall. I, I'm I'm really starting to lean that way that maybe it's time to. You know, bring in a, uh, which is, which is why the uh, I've forgotten his name at the at the point. I don't have it in the notes, but the such as the Texans uh, general manager who stepped down on his own oh, right. and has been interviewed already. Uh, you know, he he's got a track record of success, build a playoff team. You know something. You know, because I'm with you. Because first time head coach, I don't think is going to bother me that much as long as you know. I don't really care about the X's and O's at this point. I think what this team needs is a guy who can. I, you know, I wouldn't say well, – well, we'll put it this way. Jim Caldwell was not an X's and O's guy, but the players would have ran through a wall for the man. I mean, as they said, Jim Caldwell was probably one of the best uh, head coaches out there Monday to Saturday. <laughs> it was just when Sundays it would catch up with them. But that's – you know, I think that's what this team needs right now. They need, uh, I guess, a, a uniter, not a divider. <laughs> I hate to use that kind of a term. But that was pretty much obvious what happened with uh, Matt Patricia. He was the divider. And he did, you know, it finally came to the point, if you weren't with me, you're against me, I'm going to get rid of you. And, for example, Quandre Diggs, who they got rid of for a fifth-round draft pick, was just, was named to the Pro Bowl as a uh, Seattle Seahawk, for example. So, yeah, this is uh, – I, I, I agree with you. I think the, or at this point, the way this roster – Needs a complete reset. The way the salary they're capped out. They're they're going to be they're, I won't say they're capped out, but they're going to be strapped for cash uh, for uh, for uh, salary cap room, essentially because they're expecting the salary cap to go down because of uh, related to the pandemic and revenues. So the the uh, general manager is going to have I, I think the best best way to put it, he's going to have a minefield to go through when it comes to resetting the roster. Resetting some of the contracts, figuring out if you're going to keep or trade Matthew Stafford, uh, and also you know the coaching staff because the coaching staff is going to be completely blown up, and that also means that quite possibly maybe the scouting department will be blown up as well. There's a whole lot of uh, the, the the football guy, whoever it ends up being, is going to need a lot of support, and he's going to have to have a long leash. And I find him, I'm asking for a five-year contract, <laughs> at least. And I think the other thing we also have to remember is what, what's the old, um, uh, what they say about uh, general managers, they get two coaches. You, that's the, uh, you know, you're allowed to fire one guy. If the second guy doesn't work, you're gone. And essentially, that's what's happened with Quinn, because when it comes down to it, he accepted Jim Caldwell as his head coach. I call that his first hire. Patricia was his second and here we are. So well, that's you know, that's the thing. The other thing too, Al, is that at least and and, and some I was watching some of the, the chatter on Twitter during the yeah. uh, debacle on Sunday, and, and yep. somebody was saying, you know, geez, what a this has got to be one of the most least attractive, you know, GM jobs out there that are uh, at least of the ones that are available. And I thought, well, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I know it's tempting. It's, it's it's it seems intuitive to say that because of. The situation, but if you're a guy, especially if you're an experienced guy, and this is what comes down mm. to your experience, what we were talking about with experience. Yeah. If you're an experienced guy and, and you look at this situation, first of all, the, the fan base has resigned themselves to the fact that this is a rebuild. Yeah. The fan base, I think, as a whole, understands that this is a blow it up scenario. This is yeah. not a. Like when Quinn came in in '16, it was like, well, we got maybe we got something going still. Mm -hmm. oh, well, maybe you know, but now it's no. This is a full blown rebuild. So the new GM now uh, has the has the knowledge that the mm -hmm. not that you ever work, not that you let the fans make your decisions, but you'll know that when you come in that you've got a fan base that's pretty much said, okay, you know, even though even in this 
rebuild weary fan base, which yeah. is, I mean, they're just tired of rebuild. All the teams are rebuilding at the same time. Mm -hmm. the, the Lions fans, I think, have resigned themselves to believe that this is this is just a rebuild now. This is right. nothing, at least, especially on the defensive side of the ball, at least. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, at the crossroads, maybe with the quarterback and so forth, and even with other receivers. So there's there's that knowledge. You come in knowing that there this is you're starting almost the ground zero. The other thing is that there's the challenge, of course, especially again if you've got that experience of of awakening a sleeping giant. And of course, the Lions have been sleeping for 60 years. But mm -hmm. if you feel like you can, you can, if you have that kind of confidence and you've got that experience behind you, that you think that you can be the guy yeah. that does indeed finally put is able to put all those pieces of the puzzle together. I almost look at this coach Al, whoever this this coach is going to be. As you know, we, let's, we, you know, you and I were talking about we're not, we don't care if it's a first year guy or not. I think this this coach is almost like your transitional coach, kind of like your Ron Garten hire, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, the guy that's going to get you through a couple of years, maybe keep the keep things under control, mm -hmm. maybe establish a culture. If you if you get lucky, and you, you get in the playoffs in a couple of years, like with Jim Schwartz yeah. did in his third year, great. But I don't know that the next guy. That this you mentioned the GM gets to hire two coaches. I don't know that this first coach is going to be the one that's going to be the, the, the guy that's going to mm -hmm. be with this new GM for five years and lead them to the promised land necessarily. But but it, it is still important. Now, unlike Bob Quinn, yeah, who I don't think when he came in necessarily had to fire the coach. I you know I know that he wasn't maybe you know he didn't really know Caldwell that well and mm -hmm. he, he wasn't I don't think he was necessarily enamored with the guy but yeah. I think he felt like he had other things to do and that Jim was a very experienced coach he had been in the Super Bowl he, mm -hmm. he, he was very experienced and he knew what he was doing so he didn't feel like Bob Quinn I don't think felt like he needed to go that route but now the GM this GM though yeah. does have to pick a new coach we presume at least that's the way it's going to go so this is going to be important this isn't going to be some throwaway you mentioned that Quinn you know, letting Caldwell stay in the job was considered his first hire. Right. That, that may be true. But that's still not the same thing as yeah. interviewing candidates and bring and literally hiring a guy, which is what, which is what uh, this new GM is going to have to do. So it'll be interesting to see where this new GM goes in terms of the coach. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know if he does indeed, you know, hire somebody like a Robert Saleh, you know, the defense coordinator with the 49ers. It seems to be kind of like the local. Favorite. Mm -hmm. It seems to be league-wide figure to, to be in Detroit. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm more way. If I'm a Lions fan, I'm way more. I have my eyes way more cast on who gets the GM job than I am the coaching job. Right. Yeah. It's a. Yeah. That's pretty much <laughs> where we're at right now. And but now we're in a holding pattern. You know, at least the Lions. Credit they they have interviewed a significant number of people so like seven or eight so far and there's yeah. still more to come right and but there still hasn't been much movement on the coaching search of it but I have a feeling as a lot of these guys are still they're still working so they can't be interviewed right, right now right. so so right now we're kind of in a holding pattern pattern until the end of the year so we got a couple of weeks yet before we uh, well I think uh, before we see what happens route, uh, Al if they go the yeah. uh, Robert Soleil route they don't they're not making the playoffs. Right. Yeah. That would. Yeah. Would be my first phone call they, soon they as soon as the season ends. After him next week. Really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, exactly. If, if, if that. If he's. Uh, I wouldn't be. Well. He. He's got to get interviewed. I, I'd be shocked that he did. Yeah. we will probably bring him in next week. As early as next week. And, and, yeah. And, and not hire him. So to interview him next week. Because uh, they don't have to wait for the playoffs. And, and, mm -hmm. You know, with Patricia, they had to wait all the way through the Super Bowl to hire him. Now they all they have to do is just if if there's a guy that's on the radar that's not in the playoffs. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as those games are over on Sunday night, they can start interviewing. So yep. we'll see. I would yeah, because that would be like uh, the same situation if, like Eric Bieniemy, who's considered one yeah. of the top prospects, but, uh, head coaching prospects, but he's with the Chiefs as their OC. Right. Yeah. They, might, he, they might not be able to talk to him until late February, mid-February right. probably. Right. Right. So, yeah, it's a interesting situation. Now we're in kind of a holding pattern, and we're just going – Going to have to, well, at least I'm, I'll likely be up north, so I won't even have to watch the two teams go through the motions in the Lions and Vikings this Sunday. Uh, you know, as, well, let me uh, ask you this question. Do you, yeah. do you think they would have the, do you think the Lions would have the temerity 
to hire a coach before they hire a GM? I think if they, I, I, I could under, I could see them doing it if they actually get blown away, but then that would change your GM search because then you would have to hire a GM. Well, there's a couple of reasons because, well, the GM would have to approve of whomever you'd hire, and so that might suddenly shrink your candidate base by quite a bit because you now they may want they may want to go in a different direction. I can see it happening. I I'd be kind of questioning if it would be a good idea though cuz I really I'm I am really scared of this team making some dumb decisions. <laughs> and hiring a head coach ahead of a GM this feels like a dumb decision right now considering considering the state of the franchise right now because this is going to have to be a no, everybody has to be going in the same direction, has to be pulling yeah. in the same direction to fit this, to fix this organization. So you can't hire a head coach who says, well, I want to do this. And then all of a sudden you have some great candidates for GM who says, I want to go that way instead. So now all of a sudden I think you're really making things harder than they need to be, if you know what I'm saying. So I would, yeah, I would go GM first and, uh, you know, there's a ton of good candidates out there, you know, and as we've as we've long found out, oftentimes the guy who doesn't isn't your first pick works out great, you know. So uh, there's you know you, you may not get the first guy you offered a job to, but in the end that might have been the wrong guy anyway. So uh, I'm all for you know get the right GM, let him involve in getting the head coach, and and go from there it just it makes too much sense to do it that way than kind of go bass backwards by hiring a coach unless you're giving the coach gm power which rarely works out anymore i mean right. just see bill o'brien so or see wayne fonts for that matter yeah all right uh, enough woe woe this is me when it comes to the lions before we get woe is me in regards to the tigers uh, how about question two of the birthday game sure uh football uh, 1936, died in 1998, uh, Hall of Famer, um, one of the best at ever at his position. He uh, was one of the leaders on the defensive side of the football, I will say that, for uh, the team of the 60s, and I will mm -hmm. probably know what team that is. And I will also tell you that he went to the University of Illinois, uh -huh. much like another famous uh, NFL linebacker right. about 10 years later. Uh, five years later, maybe, yeah. and he um, um, was a middle. I think you can stop right there. Yeah, uh, it's probably Ray Nitschke. Yeah, yeah, Ray Nitschke. Yeah, Ray Nitschke, who um, played for 15 years for the Packers. Only Bart Starr played longer for the Packers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what can you say about Ray Nitschke? I mean, he was just. Uh, it's, it's funny that the Illinois had two great yeah. linebackers. Uh, come through there in about five or six years between Nitschke and uh, and uh, Buckus, but uh, yeah. So Ray yeah, I think of the linebacker, the middle linebackers in that division back then. You had Butkus, you had Nitschke, you had Joe Schmidt. Yeah. All Hall of Famers. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And then after Schmidt was uh, Mike Lucci, who was uh, one of those Hall of Very Good guys. Right. So there was always solid middle linebackers at that, uh, back in that era. Yeah. Black and blue division. Yeah. Now it's just uh, <laughs> watching the Lions make me blue division. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I will make room on my coffee table for the yeah, uh, history of the world for, 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 for the Phil Hellmuth book, whomever, or the Gabe Kaplan book. Or, <laughs> I have no, I, have, I can't even name any poker players. Thank God that fad is, is kind of over. Good God. But oh, that's just me. All right. With, uh, uh, with that out of the way, we ought to talk a little Tigers because they did make some news this week. Uh, one one of their top prospects uh, is an arm injury, well, a shoulder injury. He needs Tommy John surgery and Alex Fajardo. And also the Tigers made their first, I guess, significant free agent move, and that was they signed Ho uh, Jose Arena, right-hand pitcher, uh, spent his entire career with the Marlins, 29 years old. Excuse me. He signed a one-year $3.25 million deal. He was non-tendered by the Marlins. Uh Earlier this month, after six seasons with them, he had five starts in 2020. Uh, he missed the first six weeks of last season due to uh, being diagnosed COVID-19 positive. 
And he finished a very unimpressive year with a, excuse me, 5.4 ERA, 15 strikeouts, 13 walks, and 23 in a third innings pitched. Obviously a starter. He's going to be slotted right into the Tigers' rotation. His best season, 2017, he went 14-7, and 7, 3.82 ERA, 169.2 innings pitched. The uh, thing is, though, with him, you know, like the, the year he had a 3.82 ERA, his fielding independent pitching, his like his advanced metrics are not that good. He had a uh, he had a uh, FIP, a fielding independent pitching of 5.12. Essentially, that's what his ERA would be if you took out any plays that involved fielding, which would be strikeouts, walks, so on and so forth, home runs, that sort of thing. Uh, he has a plus fastball at 96 miles an hour, but it's never equated to strikeouts because his career. Uh, strikeouts per nine innings is only uh, 6.1. I think it was un- it was around five last year. So this is the guy who was apparently uh, kind of sounds like Matt Boyd in a way. A worse Matt Boyd, if you ask me. Supposedly he has some good stuff. The Tigers see something here they're hoping to be able to harness in him. But if you look at, he's essentially, if you look at his six-year career, he's had like one and a half good seasons, and even that one season... It was all his this, his traditional stats looked good, but his advanced stats were kind of iffy. And since then, he's that's not been very good at all. So, and what's funny is that this guy is best known for an incident in 2019 when he hit Brave star Ronald Acuna in retaliation for hitting a home run off him earlier in the game, and that sparked a whole big hullabaloo, if I remember correctly. Hullabaloo, that's how's that for an old-timing it. Old <laughs> uh, but, again, Greg, this really feels like another, this is just a one-year stopgap. A guy who they probably could have got cheaper if they waited another month or two. A guy who, uh, there's not, I don't think there was a lot of teams clamoring for the uh, services of Jose Arena. And this feels like Ivan Nova and all these other <laughs> one-year wonders they brought in and that didn't do a goddamn thing you know this is another yes i think this is just confirming the fact that this team is going to continue to tread water for at least another season so this you know yeah you do need guys who could eat innings because of last year and you had you know you weren't able to get uh, got like the mises and the scoop balls of the world you weren't able to ramp up their innings generally so you, this is going to be an odd year when it comes to the rotation. You're probably going to need six, seven, eight starters. But this guy is wholly and completely unimpressive. And it's just more of the same from this organization when it comes to free agents. This is a, a essentially, you're lucky if you're going to get a league average season from this guy. If you get like a one more season out of him, you've done great. Because that's really all this guy's uh, capable of. And this is just, I just found, this this was a big blah for me. Just, there was nothing here. Well, you're right. I mean, I, I, it's, hard to, I, you know, it's hard to disagree with anything you just said. I, you know, yeah. The only thing I would say is that it's, it's obviously, it's, there's no term there. It's one year. There's, it's, it's three and a quarter million dollars, not a lot of money. Right. Um, you're right about the Nova thing, Liriano, the you know, guys like that. Was it Liri- yeah. was it Liriano? Who's who's the lefty they had a couple years ago? I think it was Liriano. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they, these guys they bring these guys in, and, and, and that's fine. You know, they're gonna be mentors or whatever. I mean, you know, um, it's that's where we're at right now. I mean, that's 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 where this this rebuild is at right now the tigers are not at yet not quite yet at the point where they can start to shell out and frankly you know i you know this i am very Mm -hmm. scared of throwing a lot of money at pitchers anyway i don't like to throw a lot of years at pitchers or Mm -hmm. money at pitchers because their arms are so damn tenuous you don't know when you know they're going to pop you know pop their arm and tommy john and you know, it seems like big, fat contracts to pitchers never seem to work out, or at the very least, work out not nearly as frequently as they. I mean, don't work out way more frequently than they than they do work out. So, you know, I, if they're just, I, so I have no qualms with the with the money or the the length of the contract. Mm-hmm. But if that's just where we are right now. But they're, they're just not at the point where they they can commit 
they don't feel like they're at the point where they can com commit more than this kind of um, outlay toward toward a pitcher. Um, you know, could they could they get lucky and, and the, the guy bounces back and Urena has a good year and it, it's money well spent? Of course. Um, will will it just as likely be that that he's tossed the road aside like? No, but yes, of course. Yeah. I think that's the more likely option, to be but honest with you. It, but does it adversely affect what they're trying to do in the long term? I say no. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether this works out or not, if Eureka goes out there and has a year that stuns us, that mm -hmm. doesn't really impact the rebuild. If he goes out there and stinks like he may, that doesn't impact the rebuild either. This is just yeah. one of those things that just he probably won't even be a Tiger in 2022. He probably will be totally irrelevant. Um, and with Fiedo, you know, we can talk about him in a second. With Tommy John, just goes to show you right. another example of how young pitching, you just can't rely on it. So bringing in these veteran guys, you know, whether it's a patchwork thing like Arena, or if you're going to dare to give somebody two, two years um, and take a risk that way, mm -hmm. uh, I can see, the, I can see the, the allure to that. Um, when you have so many question marks, the Tigers have great young potential, but with their with their arms. But as we've already seen with Fajardo, you just can't count on that stuff. It just you just can't. No, what I find interesting, what we've seen what the Tigers are doing, and I guess I know the Padres are further along in what they're trying to do. They're, they were a playoff team last year. Yeah, but. They're going for it because they see a market that no one's spending, no one's doing anything, and they see that. Uh, the Cubs were, you know, I don't, I don't believe the, any of these billionaire owners, anything they're saying when it comes to their, how much money they're losing or their books. But they saw that the Cubs are going to, uh, the Cubs and the Rays are both cutting payroll. So they went out and got Blake Snell and Wu Darvis for, for, for prospects. And Snell is a bargain. He's still under contract for two or three more years at about $10 million per. I mean, that's a steal for a Cy Young-level pitcher. And Darvis, who is older, they didn't have to give up nearly as good of prospects to get him because the Cubs just wanted him off the books. And obviously, he's 36 years old, and he's kind of just bounced back last year after having a couple down years. But I, I like how the Padres are handling things and say they see a weakness in the market. And right now, the weakness is... Teams are cutting payroll. Teams are scared to spend money. Teams want to cut, cut, cut. Yeah. So the Padres are saying, we'll go against the green, and we'll take some of these guys off your hands. And all of us, oh, remember, they also have um, uh, the pitcher from Cleveland, who is, I think he's going to have Tommy John, but he's under contract for a couple years, Clevenger, the head case guy. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so next year they will have Lou Darvish, Blake Snell, and Mike Clevenger as part of their rotation, for example. So that's, I'd like their thinking, you know, who knows if it'll work out? Because as we've said over and over in this podcast, pitching tends to be kind of mercurial. Specific, but, but these guys all have track records. These guys all have a history of being very, very good to great. And the Padres are saying, we're going in. We're, we're pushing in our chips, our prospect chips. And we're going to take some of these guys off the of, off the hands of teams that don't want to spend money, that want to cut payroll, and there's a lot of teams out there like that. And I'm not saying the Tigers need to go out and get a Blake Smell or Wu Darvish, but they need to be a little more creative than what they're doing right now, if you ask me. Then essentially all, all the Tigers are doing at this point are, okay, we have prospects, we're going to play prospects, we're going to bring them up solely, and then we're going to bring in a bunch of role players to fill gaps until those prospects are ready. <sighs> Any any fan could come up with that damn uh, plan. That, that's what I think. That's what's bothering me is this team is being completely and wholly uncreative in how they're trying to rebuild this team right now. It's very by the numbers. If you and and we'll, as we'll talk about when it comes to the pitching, it's kind of pitching focused, and that's a very scary situation. If you ask me, if you're asking for your pro, your top prospects to be pitchers, yeah, you you know what. You, that's a great point because, as you know, the game has, is is tracking way uh, way more to the offense. Yeah. I mean, it's yes, everybody loves young pitching. It, it, it sounds good. Yeah. It, it sounds good. We've got a lot of young pitching. Mm -hmm. It sounds good, but you're right. This day and age, baseball teams who are good, uh, 
are built around their offense. Yeah. <laughs> and and they don't necessarily have to have Cy Young guys on their staff if they're bashing the ball over the place. I mean, and that, right. of course that's what fans want to see anyway. They want to see offense, of course. Yeah, that's give me a league dynamic. average pitching staff and a and a team that matches and you're gonna win a lot of games. Right. You know, absolutely. And so you're right. This isn't the nineteen you know, any this isn't any other decade. This is even ten years ago. You know, we're, things we're, have changed oh considerably. God, all this, you know, we're going to be the, the the Braves of the nineties. Yeah, that's a good good. That's a good comparison right there. Not, it's I'm not I'm not I'm not saying the pitching's not important. That's I think right. I should say that. But you're right to put all your eggs in the basket of our young pitching. That's what's going to, you know, sustain us. Is is. It's Just scary. It's terrifying. If you ask me. With what the way the game is played right now. Now, yeah. To your point a couple of minutes ago about about the rebuild, you know, you mentioned not getting creative and so forth. You know, it, it's very easy to start a rebuild. I mean, th- yeah. that's the easiest thing in the world to do. Is say, okay, we're going to rebuild. We're going to shed sal. Excuse me. We're going to shed salary. We're going to we're going to trade for young players. And let the let the rebuild commence. That's the yes. easy thing. Mm-hmm. The hard thing yeah. is anybody can start a rebuild. The hard thing is when do you stop? Yeah. When do you stop the rebuild? When do you say, okay, we've done the, we we pour this thing down on the stud to use your term you've used before. Yeah. How when do you, when do you make the decision to start building on the studs? And that's mm-hmm. where I think the fans are a little bit antsy. I mean, they yeah. they they know that there was a rebuild. I mean, there, there's not. It, you know, you're not giving a lot. There's not a lot of rebuild deniers out there at this point. You mm-hmm. want to say yes, this was a re- this is a rebuild. Yes, we did need to do this. At first, there were some deniers. Well, well we didn't really have to rebuild. We could have, um, you know, uh, what's the other word they use instead of rebuild? Um, retool. Retool or whatever. Yeah. We could have done that. You know, I think it's evident that no, a rebuild was indeed what was necessary. Where this team was in terms of the salary and 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 what they had in the minor league system and so forth, it had to be a rebuild. Okay, fine. So now you now they understand that. Yeah, that's fine. Now though, they're at the point where they're wondering, okay, when is the when are we gonna take that next step? When, when is and so I, I can see why you would say with a move like this, and I don't I'm not a I don't really care about you. I don't care one way or the other. About, right. This move doesn't really impact me one way or the other. But mm-hmm. I can see why you would say that this is just another you know example of here we go again. Instead of maybe some sort of, uh, you know, a little bit more juice. I, 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 I get it. I, I, I still believe that the Tigers just aren't there yet. But mm-hmm. the, I understand what the fear, the fear is that the, the the fans are saying is, will we ever? You know, when is the, when are we there? Essentially, yeah. Yeah. you know, at what point are we going to say, okay, you know, we got to stop this rebuild somehow? Now the good news is, AJ Hinch has said. Repeatedly, he wants to compete. Yes. Hired, yeah, the, the, no, we're the, mm-hmm. we're going out trying to win some ball games here. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm going to win. I don't want I don't want to sit here and and figure out how many games I can't win. I want to know how many games we can win. And so, you know, at least they've got a manager now who, again, been there, done that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I he's not content to say, okay, let's write 2021 off. You know, we'll see it 2022. Now it may be that they do indeed lose sixty percent of their game, fifty-five percent of their games next year. But the, at least the mindset of the manager is okay. Now let's that's behind us a little bit. Let's start to look forward now and start to think about winning. Now it may not be with the guys totally with all the guys that are on the forty-man roster right now, but you know he's confident. Hinch is confident that 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 Al Avila will go out and, and, and bring in people. From outside the organization, when he feels like it's time. Now, the fans are saying, "Well, when is that time?" And, and, mm-hmm. and nobody can really say, except I would. I the smart money would be that a year from now, and I, I, I guess the, the free agent class is supposed to be stronger this year, especially in places year, like shortstop year. specifically in a couple other positions. Yeah, I think that a year from now they should certainly be looking at not having these kind of arena deals and look at you know. Offense and, and bring in some bats and some and some you know I know you can't you know you can't 
buy your way out of this, but you got to bring people in and you got to bring in offense because the, the Tigers are still, everybody's still a little way, even the Riley Greens and the Torkelsons of the world are still a little bit away. So you need to bring in other guys to, 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 to you know, uh, anchor that lineup. Um, and I think this, the best thing you said in this whole discussion was when you said that they, they should. They, it, it's disconcerting to think they're putting all of their basket, all their eggs into the basket of young pitching. Is that mm-hmm. just not how the game's played right now? Yeah, and this and one thing, on and you can't yeah. rely on it. Right. No. Oh, and one thing I would also add is, uh, remember at the end of the season, what Alavila said: we are st- we're going to start building things back up. And signing Jose Arena is building sideways, not up, right. if you ask yeah. me. So, but yeah, well, actually, the offseason is not over yet. And the way things have become in Major League Baseball is that uh, we probably won't even see a flurry of signings, big any more signings, probably until we get close to spring training in February. So we probably have another four to six weeks of just of nothing until someone decides to start signing someone, and then there'll be a flurry. Of things, probably of, uh, you know, everybody's trying to outweigh each other, and we got players that are hoping for better contracts that are not, they don't want to sign right away. And the next thing you know, we'll be on the verge of spring training, and then we might see a flurry of things. And, you know, maybe I'll change my tune then. But as of right now, I am wholly unimpressed by this offseason, which leads us to Alex Fiedo. Uh He was their number one pick in 2017. He's probably. Uh, he was probably trending towards bottom of the rotation, bullpen kind of arm, but he was trekking to the big leagues. But uh, he, uh, last August it was announced they were going to end his season. He was down at the alternate site, as they called it in Toledo uh, last year. Um, he was been, hey, I've been wished to the cornfield, as they say. And he, at the time, he just called it forearm tightness. Well, obviously rehab didn't work. There was more issues uh, there. It was announced about a week and a half, two weeks ago, that he will undergo Tommy John surgery and will miss the entire season. And this is what's, well, when we get into this pitching, as, as you were talking about earlier, given a full recovery from Tommy John could take from a year and a half to two years. Alex Fajardo will be pushing 27 years old before he even sniffs the big leagues. He's 25 right now. So, and that's if he ever does make the big leagues at this point, you know, uh, look at the struggles of uh, of Michael Fulmer coming back from uh, Tommy John. He was awful last year. But as we're talking about, you know, the Tigers pitching and they're banking on some of these prospects, I mean, this, there's a huge risk. And I and seeing all this re- reminded me of the term that baseball, I think it was baseball prospectus, came up with. Uh, there is no such thing as a pitching prospect. And that's a warning to teams not to overinvest in young pitchers even more so high school young pitchers, yeah. due to their high rates of attrition. Right. And, and I just made a quick list here of the Tigers' prospects and what has happened over the past two, three years with their prospects. Obviously, Fajardo uh, is having Tommy John's going to miss this year. Uh, Joey Wentz, who was uh, one of the, their big gets, and I think it was it the trade for the Cubs, uh, he had uh, Tommy John last March. So who knows what he'll be like this spring. Michael Fulmer is still recovering from Tommy John and knee surgery. He's had to redo his entire, um, all his his mechanics, and he had like what an eight ERA last year. Uh, we, we had uh, Matt Manning had to be shut down last August. He was shut down at the same time as Fajardo due to forearm tightness. Uh, Bo Burrows and Kyle Funkhauser have battled shoulder issues. These are all high draft picks or guys who were ma- picked up in trades. Franklin Perez, who was the centerpiece of the Astros trade for Justin Verlander has been hurt for three years now, and he's probably pitched, what, 20 innings in three years? 20, 30 innings, if that. Daniel Norris has struggled struggled for years with injuries, and only in the last season or so where he's become this opener, middle relief kind of guy has he been able to stay healthy, but he battled injuries for two or three seasons. So, here you have this organization. Oh, and let's not even forget Tariq Skubal. He had Tommy John like three years ago. So I think he had it when he was in college. So there is, this is the, anybody who thinks that the Tigers are set in their rotation for the next several years 
That is wishful, wishful, wishful thinking because I am terrified that none of these guys will ultimately pan out. You know, Casey Mize and Fiedo and Manning and Scubo and you know, Burroughs, all these, and Wentz are all highly thought of. And almost every one of them has had a, has a very iffy medical history very recently. So it's, you know, you're hoping that one or two of these guys, one, if one of these guys becomes an all-star pitcher, you've hit the damn jackpot because... No, we've we've been fans long enough to see that, and we've said in this podcast how many times, Greg. Whenever there's a trade between with, when you get a big league star or a big league player in exchange for prospects, ninety nine times out of a hundred, the team that gets the big league ball player wins the trade. And we just we've had an example of that with Justin Verlander. Justin Verlander has gone on to to become you no know, essentially solidify his Hall of Fame credentials. While the three prospects the Tigers got in exchange have done little to nothing, so I'm very leery of banking on the, on any of these starters to make it big. Do they have the talent? Yeah, but the odds are, majority of these guys are going to flame out. They're either going to get injured or they're going to be bad, and then we're going to be wondering what's next. Call me a cynic, but okay. I've seen this too often. I've you know, seen it too I often. Think, I think you're just playing the odds i, I think mm-hmm. that the odds say yeah that what that scenario you just laid out with um um some of these guys i mean well, yeah. not all not all the scenario laid out that not all of these guys are going to pan out is the safest scenario i think it's very possible none of them pan out well that's the yeah, thing that's true i mean I, I i like to think that at least one or two of them will become at least you know a number two or a two mineral rotation or, guy would be ice yeah but to, to look at these guys and say, hey, you know, this this is our – meet your starting rotation in 2023, every single one of them. Yeah. That, that's really – And there's been a lot of people in the fan base have been acting that way. It's the, the – the, yeah, it's, you've, it's just not the way that the teams are built nowadays. It's, it's offense, it's offense, offense, offense. I know a lot of people don't like the game the way it's played. Now. I know it's a lot of home runs and strikeouts. I get it. Three two outcomes. The way I like the game to be played, either. Yep. But that's the way it is. That's mm-hmm. what fans want. Apparently, that's the way teams are building uh, the rosters. Is with these all or nothing type. Everybody goes up there is either a home run or a strikeout. Uh, yep. It's, you know, and, and and more strikeouts you have, the longer the usually the longer the at bats are, and that's why you get extended you know pitch counts and so forth. When it takes a guy you know 100 pitches to get through five innings, mm-hmm. because you know guys are. Striking out, but before they strike out, they're falling balls off and so yep. forth. Yeah, you know, it, so it's not, you know, it's just not our the baseball, the game of baseball you and I grew up with. But that's the way it always has been. Things evolve, but uh, yeah, the the, um, the 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 rebuild is at a really crucial time right now because yep. the next decisions, whether they're going outside the organization or whatever, um, are you know. The, the decisions they made two or three years ago aren't – why was it forgotten any, already forgotten about? Yeah. The decisions they're going to be making now, though, Al, mm-hmm. really impact the, the future direction of this ball club a lot more than those – the decisions they made in 2017, 2018, uh, you know, those are done. Yeah. The decisions they make now, though, I think will have a more, a more lasting effect. Yeah. And it could go either way. It could go good or bad. Right. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm thinking about how you're just talking about, you know, baseball has changed. You know, really, it's become three true outcomes. You know, strike out, walk, or home run. The early '90s Tigers would were essentially they, they were essentially 20 years ahead of their time. because yeah. they were full of guys like uh, Mickey Tettleton and Cecil Fielder and um, Rob Deere. That was their. That was those were all. That was their mo. You know, they were either going to strike out or hit the ball out of goddamn Tiger Stadium. And if they had any kind of pitching at all, they would have won a lot more because they did have the, the perfect offense for today's kind of baseball. Or Earl Weaver baseball, who was another guy who was way ahead of his time when it came to yeah. how baseball is played today. Because what his uh, his perfect offense was two walks and a three run bomb, yeah. as he always said. So yeah, it's uh, and I guess that's the other thing. Uh, just going back a little bit to the Tigers, it seems to be so much easier to project out hitters. 
yeah. than it is project out pitchers. Yeah. And, you know, and pitching is such an unnatural thing to do. It's such an unnatural motion that, you know, it's a, it's, there, there are accidents waiting to happen when it comes to their arms. And when you have a guy like a Justin Ver, I was going to start with Justin Verlander. Now he's hurt. That's right. I forgot. He hurt his arm finally after 15 years. But, yeah, but the, those workhorses are harder and harder and harder to find. And I don't know. I guess I, I'm just bummed that we're going to have another year of a 90 to 100 losses and another year of, you know, Nico Goodrum in the middle of the order, <laughs> if you know what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So they can't get guys like uh, Meadows and, and Torkelson and – uh, these guys up soon enough. This sparks some excitement with the team because uh, it's, it's. I think it's going to be lacking this year, especially in. We still don't even know how the season's going to pan out. With uh, you no, know, we're still in middle of a pandemic, and we don't know what the season's going to look like. And the other scary part is, Greg, we have labor, we have we have owner, we have owner player labor negotiations coming up very, very soon. And it's going to get ugly. And who knows if we're going to have a 2022 season or if that's going to start on time. So baseball's in a very kind of a scary place right now. When you think about it, it really is, especially in this town. All right. With that, we, uh, before we start wrapping things up, we'll touch a little bit on the Pistons who are actually playing as we speak right now. As I look at the score, they are losing to the Warriors by two early in the third. But, uh, they have started the season at 0-3, which is not unsurprising considering there's only four returnees from last year's team. Uh, it's, it's a very, very a lot of rookies, a lot of uh, free agent pickups, a lot of uh, well, it's, uh, as we said, it's a rebuild, and they finally grasped it. And I think the most refreshing thing I've seen with the Pistons, other than seeing a lot of new fresh faces and the team actually sparking some interest in me because of these young guys. Is Tom Gores this week finally has b- admitted buying into the rebuild, as he said, tr- GM, new GM Troy Weaver, quote unquote, owned the offseason. and he and he went into uh, you know kind of selling it. You know, we have to see how these young men develop. Troy did the, as he said, Troy right away did that is uh, he thought he was thoughtfully aggressive. I guess that's the words I'm looking for. He owned it. He had three first-round picks, a second-round pick. He likes it. Tom Gores essentially went into salesman mode, saying he approved everything Troy Weaver has done this point and now is asking for patience from the fan base after essentially he was the first 10 years of Tom Gores' ownership. Greg reminds me of the first 10 years of uh, Mike Illich's ownership of the Tigers. You know, where there is a, a lot of money thrown around, a lot of movement of players, a lot of we're going to try and compete, but, you know, we're kind of half-assing it. And it took, for Illich, it took the 2003 season to embarrass him to the point where he changed how he ran the team. I think of Gores, I think it was the uh, Blake Griffin trade essentially blowing up and not working is what changed his mind about just having to rebuild his team. So, at the very least, you know, I still don't like Tom Gores. He's still too L.A. for me. And, obviously, I, no, he is the a Gordon Gecko type. You know, if, if anybody has ever, obviously everybody has seen uh, Wall Street. But that's exactly the kind of guy he is. You know, he, I don't approve how this man has made his money. You know, one of his most profitable enterprises is he owns a company that supplies phone services to prisons. And they charge outrageous amounts of money to people who can't afford it for them to make phone calls out of a prison. So Tom Gores is a very, very sketchy kind of billionaire, if you ask me. But he owns the team, and he's finally bought into a rebuild. The Pistons finally have some interesting young players. No more Reggie Jacksons anymore. He's got layers of his ilk. No more Andre Drummond, thank goodness. And so... On the plus side, yeah, they're starting to rebuild, and there's some interesting players. On the con side, I'm I'm still not impressed by Tom Gores as an owner, but here we are. Well, you know, owners are judged by wins and losses, just like the coaches are. The difference is that owners can't get fired. Yeah. You know, what's a successful ownership is wins and losses. That's what it, nobody, yeah. nobody looks at an ownership of, of a sports team and cares about. Um, anything other than that. There's, yeah. that. there's Nothing else matters. 
to the fans, and it shouldn't matter, frankly, then wins or losses. And yeah. um, and I will go so far as to say you mentioned you being sketchy. Uh, sketchy. Again, fans don't care as long as the team yeah. or yeah. loses. <laughs> it, it can become an issue if you lose. It's not an issue if you win. Fans just want to win. They, they could care less about anything else, and especially here. Especially yeah. in Detroit where, I mean, the, the, the losing is just getting everybody down. Everybody is losing. Even Michigan State is 0-3 in basketball. I mean, when was the last time you saw that? I mean, nobody can win in this town. Yeah. I mean, nobody can win. And yeah. so, you know, you get to a point where you don't care who wins. You don't care who wins and, and how they win. You don't care, you know, how they do it by hook or by crook. Just win yeah. some damn games. And that's what, uh, you know, um, so th- that's that's the way that's the way that is. But you know, as far as the Pistons go, out, the the, the um, I think that the Dwayne, I think right now you're really seeing the importance of, of having higher Dwayne Casey. Yeah. Ago. Because a guy like him, Casey, who's got a wealth of experience and who is widely regarded around the league, around the league, is one of the best coaches in the NBA. For his ability to adapt and, and his relationship with players and how he works with young players and so mm-hmm. forth is never going to be more important than it is right now. Um, this roster right now is, is still, it seems like you and I have been saying this since we've been doing the show, uh, is, is in flux again. Yep. And so he has to be the guy. But unlike other coaches prior to him uh, who weren't nearly as well equipped to, yeah. to, to do that. Now, I, I know they came out Yeah, could you both. see... Uh... Uh, Stan Van Gundy with this group? Oh my no. God! Well, no, Casey, he he would be going nuts. He would never play any of these young guys. Wayne Casey is 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 fine. I mean, he's yeah. um, the least of the business problems right now. Yeah. In, in fact, I would go so far as to say they should be damn lucky they have him or yeah. I like him because he is. When you're in these kinds of situations with lots of attrition, lots of roster turnover, and, yeah. and kind of in the you know in the throes of a rebuild. This is the kind of guy you want. I mean, this is the kind of guy who just, he thrives on this stuff. He, you know, I know he wants to win like everybody else, but he loves this. He loves teaching kids. He loves developing guys. Um, you know, you and I might look at this roster and say, Gee, well, you know, what a mess this is." But mm-hmm. he's the kind of guy that likes this kind of stuff, and I think that that you know, it's important to have a guy like that. Um, can, uh, you know, you mentioned, can you imagine Van Gundy? But yeah, I mean, can, can you imagine? Uh, an inexper- you know, we've seen the Lawrence Franks of the world and the, you know, Mo Cheeks and Mike. The, or how about how about remember Michael Curry here when Curry he was a uh, 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 Pistons coach? Pistons had some were, very questionable coaches yeah, come through I mean, here. All, all these guys come through that just were not weren't equipped. I think I said you use yeah, that word. It's probably perfect. Now they've got a guy who, you know, he's still going to lose a lot of basketball games, but, but this is a kind of a, this is a perfect example. Oh, my, we were talking a lot about wins and losses throughout mm-hmm. this program, but this is the kind of guy who you don't judge by his win and loss record. Because right. I think I think his value in this scenario with the Pistons goes way is transcends wins and losses. Yeah, I think he is the he's like the Ralph Hulk of the seventies with the Tigers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Guy that's kind of keep this thing going, teach the young players. He, he, he doesn't seem to care how many how much the roster changes from year to year. He doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't. You know, he doesn't. I mean, he's here to stay. I mean, he's here for the yeah. long haul. Oh, he signed a long-term I contract, so he's got security. I really yeah. do. Yeah. I, yeah. He's. I think he's. Um, he's really been a, a breath of fresh air in in a, in a in a franchise that hasn't had a lot of them. And I think that um, thank goodness the Pistons, if they have anything, if they've done anything right over the past decade, it's hiring Dwayne Casey when they did. Yeah. Yeah, it's and unfortunately for poor Dwayne Casey, he was signed a bit of a bill of goods. You know, when he was hired here, they were expecting we're going to compete for the playoffs, and you know, considering he was coming off at the time uh, a conference, uh, uh, he made it to the conference finals with Toronto. Yeah, and and he's hired by the Pistons, and within a year and a half, they're rebuilding. <laughs> yeah. So, but then again, as you, he's being very very well paid. To uh, uh, the, to work with this rebuild, and obviously that gives him, I think, a significant amount of job security because he's not expected to win. All right. he, no, as long as he, uh, as you said, the, the, and he has a history of this of being good with young players, developing young players, 
And if if he just needs, he all he has to do is show progress. I don't even care if they win ten games this year; they probably will probably win like twenty. But it's all about the young players in the future of this team. And yeah, I have no complaints with Dwayne Casey. I know some people do. Like, uh, was it a couple nights ago where they uh, they went to double overtime and uh, Blake Griffin played like forty four minutes, something ridiculous like that? And they're like, why wouldn't Blake Griffin play forty four minutes? Because if he didn't play forty four minutes, they would have lost by thirty five. <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, that's the other thing I think fans have to keep in mind is that you know, a lot of them have, uh, for some reason, are under the impression that things haven't changed and the Pistons need to do a 76ers-like process where you throw the worst team out there possible and you lose you know, 75 games. or well, what's it, They won 10 games one year. I think a couple years they won like between 10 and 15 games. They had the worst record in the league. But, you know, obviously things have changed, and you don't necessarily have to have the best record, the worst record, to get the best draft pick. So, uh, you know, I just want to see entertaining, like the game last night was entertaining basketball. The Pistons end up losing by like 10 to Atlanta. But guys like Isaiah Stewart and Killian Hayes and Sadiq Bay, uh, all, they, they all contributed, played fairly well for being rookies, and, and they were fun to watch, especially a guy like Stewart. No, he had eight rebounds in like 11 minutes. Five were offensive. I mean, that, I, I looked at him and go, that guy in six months is going to be beloved by this fan base because that's the kind of player this fan base loves. They, you know, um, you know they, love those, they, they love the hard-nosed blue. They don't care how much he scores as long as he plays defense and rebounds. Right. And that's a guy like Isaiah Stewart. So there are some interesting players to watch here. It's just going to be a long season. Don't expect a lot of wins. Don't expect... Uh, <laughs> and I just, I also, I will just say this. I, I have to give a, a, a we don't know how it's ultimately going to play out, but as of right now, Blake Griffin and Derek Rose are saying all the right things. You know, they, neither one of these, these guys came in here expecting to be stuck in a complete teardown rebuild, but yet here they are and they're doing their best to compete and be mentors. And we'll see if they're here in six months. So, but it's going to be an interesting season just in that it, it's, Completely different, Greg, from what we've seen for the last 10 years, since 2009. So, all right. Um, I guess we should just touch on the Red Wings real, real quick, because they, I believe they're starting training camp next couple of days. Regular season starts in, what, like two weeks? <laughs> Actually, I think I got their schedule up here. When does their season start? Uh, oh, God damn. Schedule. Let me bring it up here. I hate ESPN's website. I just hate their website. All right. Yeah, the season starts uh, a little more than two weeks. January 14th uh, against Carolina. And actually, their first two games of the year are w- against Carolina. Uh, actually, they're at home as well. It's like a two-game series. That's, it's going to be a weird weird season, Greg, because we're going to be seeing, uh, as I'm looking at the schedule, it's all two and three games against the same teams. Uh, and it's very much like baseball in that it, essentially you have this, everybody comes into town for a few days and they play each other and then they leave, you know, then they go on to the next town and do the same thing. And also the fact that the conference, essentially the division the, the Wings are in is essentially like being in the old Central. They're going to be playing at least for one year only, you know, teams like St. Louis and I think Dallas and uh, Chicago, Columbus, Centr- I think a couple of the, the, one of the Florida teams in the same division. It's uh, it's going to be a very very weird. It's also a very 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 weird season. It's also going to be very compressed because the season ends uh, starts in, in the mid January, ends the first week of May, and then you're going to have six weeks of playoffs, which means the season probably won't end till July. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to finally seeing the Wings play because essentially it's going to be almost ten months, <laughs> nine to ten months between games. But it's still going to be strange how the whole season is going to be set up. And, oh, let alone you know, all the Canadian teams. It was finally confirmed that all the Canadian teams are going to stay in Canada. Obviously, because they can't, you know, if they cross the border, they have to quarantine for two weeks. So, that, you know, so there's an all-Canadian division. So I'm sure the Canadians are just loving it because they'll have all the Canadian teams all to themselves. And that is actually going to kind of, Hockey Night in Canada will be kind of fun this year. <laughs> there's one thing to look forward to. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, um, who knows how this season's going to play out. But I'll just say, I don't think it can be any worse than they were last year because they were bad last year. Yes, they were. Huh. 
Well, anything else you'd like to add? Or are you ready to wrap up 2020? I think uh, ready to wrap it up. The only thing I'll say about that is that, you know, the, I guess trying to make the best of this hockey season I mean, in terms of yeah. you're not going to see a schedule like this. Maybe Ever again. Maybe your, your yeah. lifetime. Yeah. I, I know it's it may seem kind of, you know, redundant to, to, for the Revenues to play the same team, seemingly the same teams. Well, not seemingly. They are playing the same team over and over and over again. But mm-hmm. you know, you try to make the best. Maybe pretend like you're in a little uh, alternate reality, alternate the original six universe here and you see the same teams and you know and, and playing back-to-back games against these teams and kind of a different setup I, you know it's trying to make the best of it you know i, I it's it, you'll never see this again and maybe when it's all over and done you'll you'll be glad that you never will see this again right but, you know, while it's happening you know you're, you're kind of witnessing something that you could you could you know tell your grandkids about so, oh i remember in 2020, we just played uh, seven other teams, and we played them twice. We played Cal- Carolina 20 times. Yeah, <laughs> at least that's what it's going to feel like. Yeah, I mean, it's, I know it's. <laughs> I know it's not. You know, as far as the variety of teams, you're not going to see. A yeah, lot it's just going to be pretty much interdivisional, I believe. Right. Yeah, and, and then, yeah. that's. But you know, hey, if you like hockey, if you want, if you're eager to see, like you are, are eager to see, you know, NHL hockey again for, for the Red Wings at least. Yeah. And I don't think you really care who they play. I, I, th- I think you're just you just want to see them play. You want to see these kids where they're at with their development, and, and, yep. and um, you know start to see Steve Eiserman's roster. You know this is way more of his roster now than yep. it was last year at this time. Start to see how that you know how that. I don't care who you're playing. You're still they're still the NHL. So yep. whether they're playing the same seven eight teams or not, you're still going to get an opportunity to see where these where these younger players are, and so. You know, make the boat most of it. You're not expected to win anyway. Yep. Uh, so if you don't have this that extra pressure of every game means everything in the world in the standings, just try to enjoy it. Just enjoy hockey again, and and then get through this this year, and then and then we hope that this will be the last year of this kind of uh, rebuild, and then Revenues like much like the other teams in town yeah. will be able to take that next step. Yep. Yeah, I, I miss hockey. I miss I specifically miss Red Wings hockey. I mean, I enjoyed the bubble playoffs, but without the Red Wings, you know, I I really miss watching Red Wings hockey, pure and simple. I miss and I miss uh, Mickey Redmond and Ken Daniels calling the games. So, so it'll be an, uh, well. Actually, we'll have a lot more to talk about this. You know, the we'll know a lot more about the coming season the next time we talk in a couple weeks. We'll be uh, next time we talk will be right before the season starts. So. All right, with that, let's wrap this puppy up, Greg. Who is your jerk of the week? I am lumping the entire NFC East as my jerk of the week. Look at the <laughs> standings. Yeah. Uh, no team is better than six and nine. Uh, the five and ten Giants. I I don't I don't have all the tiebreakers in front of me, but the five and ten Giants, at least on the surface. And I, again, I don't know who, who's playing who this week. On the surface, has a chance to win the division if yeah. if they win and go six and ten, and Washington and Dallas, who are six and nine, both lose. And again, I don't know who plays who. Right. Everyone can f- finish six and ten except for Philadelphia. So I don't know what the tiebreaker is, but the fact that the Giants are are going into the, the last week of the season with a five and ten record, with a chance to win their division. Yeah. Is yeah, you know, I know that, that that these kinds of anomalies happen every so often, but it looks—I mean, why can't anybody take control? I mean, <laughs> obviously this division is full of bad teams, and when you look at the divisional records, everybody is either this is this is a, everybody is either three and two or two and three. <laughs> yeah. everybody, there's nobody who's one and four. There's nobody who's mm-hmm. four and one. Everybody's two and three. So nobody's taking control of this lousy division. And I, the Eagles were four ten and one, yeah, just eliminated from, from like a week or two ago from the, the division. So, I, I know this is an anomaly, but this is ridiculous. I, yeah. I, I don't know why I, why a team can't can't beat up on these other teams and, and win at least eight games. Yeah. And win the division with a five hundred record. So, my you know it's a black eye in the NFL. I, I this has been a crazy year. I understand that, but. This NFC East is, is you know, the, the Lions. If the Lions were in that division, mm-hmm. probably Matt Patricia wouldn't have been fired. So I guess maybe we should be glad that they weren't in that division. But yeah. this is this is ridiculous. So my yeah. my trick of the week is the NFC East. 
Yeah, and actually, I just looked it up here. The Giants, as you said, are 5-10. and 10. They can win the division if uh, Washington loses to the Eagles and the Giants beat the Cowboys. Oh, and they, we could have a Cowboys. Okay. Yeah, so we could have a six and ten so division championship, and they would have a they would essentially have home game over a team with a far better record. Oh, you're saying is if Washington? So really, if Washington wins, I think that's okay, it's that, over. right. Okay, but yeah. what if, what if, if Washington we, loses and the Cowboys lose because the Cowboys are playing right, the Giants right. and the Giant the Giants would win the division at six and ten because so they, they, they would hold tiebreakers and such. Okay, so they would have a tiebreaker. Yeah. What if, what if Washington and Dallas both win and both finish seven and nine? I believe then it's uh, Washington because they had tiebreaker. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But regardless, it's just it's still ridiculous. <laughs> it is. It's 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 bonkers. So uh, that's a good call. It's it's that whole division has been a joke this year, to say the very least. I'm going to stay the NFC East for my uh, jerk of the week. Uh, I'm going to Dwayne Haskins of the Washington Football Team. Who has gone from uh, a year a year and a half ago? He was a number fifteenth overall pick in the first round. Uh, he was going to be the uh, Washington co- uh, quarterback of the future. Here we are, uh, almost at the end of a sec of his second season, and this week Washington cut his ass. They just walked away from him uh, because he the well it, the litany of things this guy has done has just been it's crazy. Like this year alone, he's been busted for. Uh, for uh, uh, violating COVID nineteen protocols twice, this uh, the 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 week before his, his final start with the uh, with Washington, he w- there was pictures of him in a strip club with no one wearing masks and no one social distancing. He got the start anyway, was completely ineffective, and was benched for. I have to look it up here. He was benched for someone named Taylor Heineke. I have no idea who Taylor Heineke is, but he was under. He played the uh, the second half of that game after they benched uh, their first round pick, Dwayne Haskins, and uh, obviously uh, he's uh, he's got a history of making very questionable decisions. I guess there's been a lot of talk. He hasn't put in the work, uh, doesn't put it in the film work, hasn't put it in the study in Washington. Oh, remember uh, when he? I believe remember when they beat the Lions last year. They had to put their backup quarterback on the field for victory formation because Haskins was taking selfies of people in the stands. Right. That's yes. Right. I forgot about that. You were. Yeah. So this guy's had a history of making very dumb decisions, and he's. Uh, it's not as if Ohio State quarterbacks have a good NFL reputation as it is. He has just soiled it completely. So. I don't blame uh, Washington one bit for washing their hands of this guy because. You know, he he had a very bad rookie season, yet they rolled into this year hoping him that he would become their starting quarterback, and he ended up getting benched for Alex Smith, who almost lost his leg two years ago due to a horrific injury, and that he couldn't play again, and he's being benched for guys they picked up off the street. So my jerk of the week is um, Dwayne Haskins, who couldn't even remain at quarterback for a, a really bad team in a really bad NFC East. Oh, my God. What a waste of a draft pick. You know, who knows? He might find finally rede- find redemption, or he might just end up like Ryan Leaf. So who the hell knows? I hope he doesn't end up like Leaf, but we'll, we'll see. No, he might just – I'll just say probably, the odds are he'll probably end up as a complete bust as a quarterback. And yeah. Or how about Johnny Manziel? Johnny Menzel, how oh. we pronounce it? That would be another one. No, that would be another highly drafted first round pick who you know who is out of the league in two years. So, oh my God, oh. and that's then that's why you have Lions fans saying we can't get rid of Matt Stafford. Yeah. <laughs> all right, with that, Greg, let's wrap this show up. Uh, why don't you get out the uh, thank yous and all the other fun stuff? Sure. Uh, read me in my WordPress blog, uh, Out of Bounds. Uh, pretty much every Monday, I've got a new piece up on there. You can also follow me on Twitter. That's where you can catch the. I link my, my articles there as well. Uh, uh, at Greg, you know, and the Knee Jerks can be followed on Twitter uh, at the Knee Jerks. Uh, and want to thank my lovely wife Sharon for putting up with this nonsense, and thank you, Big Al, for making Tuesday nights so gosh darn fun. Yes, yes, Tuesday nights. So weird saying Tuesday nights. Mm-hmm. So. Anyway, uh, again, thank you, Greg, for uh, taking time out of your schedule. That uh, much like me, you don't leave home much, so uh, not like we're hard to find anymore right now. But 
Thanks for making 2020 a little bit easier. I know we took a, a good chunk of the year off because things were just so out of whack, but these last few months have been a little bit of normalcy in what's been a very abnormal year. If you know these two hours where we hang out, yeah. So thank you for that. I'll give a shout out to uh, Linda, who's busy saving lives in the air tonight. She's uh, worked her ass off during this pandemic. She actually got, uh, for what it's worth, she did get uh, her first inoculation of the vaccine oh, last good. week. Good. Obviously, you no, know, she's she's at the front of the line because she's actually exposed to this on a daily right. basis. And sure. I, I know I'm not a religious man, but I do. I am thankful that she hasn't caught it. You know, God, you know, because she's at risk. She's my age. So, you know, so anyway, I just want and I want to give a shout out to anybody and anybody who has listened or we are anybody (laughs) had dealings with this year. We've all been through a lot. We all can't wait for this year to end. We uh, well, I think we're I'm hoping for better things for everybody. I don't care what your political persuasion is. I don't care what your religion may be. I don't care if. We're polar opposites into what we believe in. I want the best for everybody in 2021 because 2020, you know, I'm lucky. I've managed okay. You know, I, I have a roof over my head. I have a food in the house. I'm not, we're, I'm not hurting for, I, I'm not losing anything. I'm able to pay my rent. I'm able to, I have money in my pocket. I'm okay. I'm not rich by any means, but I'm not... In a, I have, it hasn't been a crisis, if you know right. what I mean. Right. And a lot of people, these last several months have been one crisis to the next. They don't know where their next paycheck's coming from. They don't know, yep. you know if they're going to have money for rent. You know, And what's been going on in Washington has not helped things one bit. So I just hope in the next couple months things calm down to the point where we're <laughs> – I, you know, it's weird now. I just hope for things to get back to normal because things have not been normal for 10 months. Yep. And, and the thing is that we all have to remember is even after the vaccine, there's, I think it's, we're going to be in a new normal. We really will be. Yep. So we don't know what that new normal is going to yeah. be, but it can't be any worse than what we've been through in the past 10 months. So uh, with that, with me, I think we're done pontificating for 2020. We'll be back renewed and fresh and have some fresh hot takes for 2021. In two weeks. So until that time, uh, January 2021, we'll talk to you then. So until that time, this is Al Beaton saying good evening, good luck, and aloha. Shout out everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Go to hell, 2020.